please come here, John. Yeah. Thank you for that kind introduction and for probably dating me beyond my years, although I'm not a spring chicken. Um, I want to spend a few minutes um, up front. We want to talk, you know, Julie, Julie and I are strategic partners. A lot of the focus at Consensus Point is working with research agencies, providing a white label solution to be able to give them another tool with which to be able to approach their clients. And if you take a look at a lot of what we've talked about um, here at the conference to date, starting with our keynote speaker yesterday, and then if you overhear some of the conversations that are in the hallway, a lot of it, a lot of it is around the level of anticipatory research. You know, Strategy One has been talking about this for a while, that we're in this age of anticipatory research, and prediction markets fit in there very, very, you know, a, a drop appropriately. You know, so we've seen the change within the industry, and you know, that's pretty much where the focus is. And what I want to do for the next few minutes is give you a brief grounding in prediction markets. I'm not going deep by any means. And then turn it over to Julie, because she's got a tremendous story as to how she worked along a product development um, journey with one of her clients, leveraging their skills in managing a community, a number of different tools, as well as prediction markets. Okay? So I think we all pretty much get the basics of what a prediction market is. You know, it's an opportunity to be able to leverage a community, and a community can be a wholly owned and maintained community, such as the work that Communispace does. It can be an external sample, if that's appropriate for the particular study. But it's there to be able to uncover forward-looking needs. So going back to the anticipatory research aspect of it. Okay? And what a prediction market really does is it moves individuals away from being respondents to really being partners. Because at the end of the day, in a prediction market, I really don't care how you will react to the stimulus I put in front of you. I care how you predict that I will respond. So I'm forcing you to think harder, to think deeper, to be able to leverage observed behavior as opposed to stated intent. And for any of us that are parents, we know how well stated intent does not work with our children. Okay? It is very specifically outcome focused. Individuals self-select for knowledge and perspective. So if you're not familiar with the topic, you don't play the game. Okay? What you end up with in the prediction market is very clear differentiation between the ideas, if in fact one exists. You're going to see elimination of overstated purchase intent. And within some industries, that's a huge consideration. You'll see the reinforcement of the key driving attributes that will drive you towards success and opportunities for product enhancement. Now, this is in one of its traditional sweet spots, which is new product concept testing. But prediction markets are also being leveraged to understand future trend identification, how will consumers react to uh, new products and ideas 12 to 18 months out? Okay. Prediction markets are delivered on a multi-platform level. So whether you're on a smartphone, you're on a desktop laptop, or you're on a tablet, with no app required, this, the survey will be rendered appropriately for you. So you're not losing that 10 to 15% of individuals who take studies on mobile any longer. That also tends to force you to be very concise in what you're testing and what you're asking to get you down somewhere in 10 to 12 minutes so you don't lose those folks. But also from a research perspective, it keeps them much more sharper and much more focused on what you're doing. And there's also a level of light gamification in here. People earn badges as they go through a prediction market. It merely helps keep them more engaged and more enlightened. And what do you get out of it? You get a blend of qual and quant data. So you understand qualitatively what the likelihood of success is. What's the probability that this event will happen? That information is a key blending of those who've said, yes, it will happen versus no, as well as what we call the strength meter, and that's a measure of resonance. So that's an analysis of the token allocation, the virtual currency that they use in there. That's what clearly tends to separate out the great ideas from the mediocre ideas. And there's also an analysis provided of the open-ended commentary as well. So being able to take a look at frequencies and you know, word counts as to what are the key drivers that are out there. Should I get hit the wrong button? Okay. You'll also get an understanding as to what maybe you know, unique niche ideas are. They tend to be tweaked out a little more effectively with the prediction market. So if you look here at concept B, you see it only has a 71% likelihood of success. Not a bad score by any means, not to, not to indicate that. However, 
you know, if you take a look at the spread analysis on the right hand side, you see there's a tremendous amount of positive energy around that and a fair amount of negative energy around that. What that's indicating is further analysis behind the open-ended commentary to understand what those drivers are of negativity. This could be a very strong niche opportunity or a concept with minor changes that could actually drive significant success. And to debunk one of the myths about um, prediction markets, they've always been thought of, it's new product concept testing. That's all it is, it's new product concept testing. Well, it truly is not because it hits on a number of different areas. It hits in the foundation discovery area. We have a number of clients that take a look of what vitamins and minerals and additives are going to be resonate most effectively with the health conscious consumer in the next 12 to 18 months to provide guidance to manufacturers as to what they should be looking for. You know, it's in the new product development stage. So it's, yes, coming out of ideation sessions and you've got 42 different ideas and which, which ones do we focus on? How do we weed those down? into the brand marketing, the retail activation, and the customer and product experience. There are a number of different key areas of application for prediction markets as you move down the path. So with that, let me turn this over to Julie and let her share with you some of her, ex her experiences. Thank you. Um, so at Community Space, when we do online uh, communities, and these tend to be private, they tend to be small, uh, they tend to be very focused on building relationships. Um, and our overarching objective always is to find ways to engage people, yeah, not as, as Andrew said, not as respondents, but as partners, um, and to really engage them intellectually, emotionally, to engage their creativity um, in, in a much fuller, more holistic way. So we're always on the lookout for alternatives to traditional concept tests, um, traditional testing of any sort. Um, you know, in our experience, all too often everything comes out of 3.5 on a five-point rating scale and people are, are sort of responding to questions around which they don't actually have a point of view. So we looked to prediction markets uh, in the early days as a way to, to do that sort of um, filtering work and testing work, but in a way that engaged people in, in a more all-rounded and authentic uh, way. Um, at this point, we've done over 70 or so prediction markets for a range of clients, and at pretty much every stage in the product and service life cycle, as John just um, illustrated. So I'm going to tell you just one story, um, and I'll just be up front. The moral of this story is that um, anything you, you test or evaluate in the context of a prediction market still needs to be founded in rich, deep insight, or you're kind of wasting your time. So I want to tell you a story about a, a leading health and beauty care brand, a client of ours, um, with whom we did a, an extensive co-creation project, really starting with exploration and discovery. Um, this was to inform a new sub-brand of, of antiperspirant. Um, the story ended 13 weeks later, which was kind of a record uh, at a time that, that uh, was 30% versus the, of, of the time they normally spend on new product development. Um, but we began with a very deep emotional exploration of what scent was um, and, and looking at emotional as well as the sort of rational and functional needs associated with the category. So we did mobile ethnography work, for example, where we asked people to over the course of a week to take pictures or videos or do audio recordings or give us little text explanations of the sense that they encountered in their daily life that made them feel good. Um, the power of this is that it immediately took us and, and our clients outside of the typical sort of repertoire of scents who associate with personal care products and antiperspirants, right? Because we're getting pictures of Play-Doh and drying paint and freshly cut grass and what they all underscored is sort of the power of scent um, to take you somewhere else in time, uh, to take you somewhere else really even in space. This notion of scent as a, as a way to transport you um, became a really foundational insight that informed the ultimate product uh, direction. We then kind of built on that with various kinds of letter writing exercises and, and just peer-to-peer -peer discussions and some mind mapping work. Um, and ultimately in acquired this, this pretty foundational insight around the power of scent um, to transport you. Um, and also used image annotation um, in some interesting ways to get at the kind of um, self-critique that women are continually applying, <laughs> subjecting themselves to, 
um, as well as how other, their concerns around how others perceive them. So what you see at the bottom here is um, a handful of brave women in this community uploaded pictures of themselves, offered up their own critique of themselves, and then recused themselves while other people in the community annotated that image with their sort of commentary. Um, not surprisingly, women are much harder on themselves than other women are on them. Um, in any case, out of all of this qualitative and iterative and ongoing work came the, the foundational insight that informed the development of this new um, platform. We then worked closely with our client's creative agency to create some product concepts that we then tested using motion-centric, which is a proprietary method that gets at both um, the emotional benefits and the potential uh, emotional barriers um, to, to a concept. And again, is a nice meld of quantitative and qualitative approaches in the same way that prediction markets are. And then finally, we took three new concepts that had come out of this co-creation work, along with a fourth control concept for an existing product, and put it into a prediction market. Um, and now you begin to see the sort of nuance of uh, feedback and insight you get from this methodology. So you'll see here product A, number one, attracted, I mean, clearly that is the, the concept people were passionate about because 52 people chose to invest um, in an outcome, whether it was yes or no in terms of whether it will be, I think the question we asked, well, will it be perceived as unique? Would it prompt people to switch brands? Um, a handful of questions like that. And, and questions can be either these binary yes, no questions or multivariate questions we're asking what's going to be the most likely to yield a certain outcome. So just kind of seeing this huge concentration of investment in product A as opposed to the other products right away told us, oh, there's something going on there. Um, you then look at the overwhelmingly positive nature of the investment. So 51 people investing in yes versus one in no. You can look at the total points or tokens invested in each concept. And again, in this case, I mean, this was a really compelling case. Um, often we see thing, products a, a bit closer um, than this one. But again, you sort of see this huge investment of points in product A. Um, and again, what's interesting is you see what's attracting negative investment as well. So for people to invest points against the likely success or against the uniqueness of product C um, also tells us a lot. Often a polarizing concept can be a good niche product. In other cases, when you see that level of negative investment, it suggests you know, there's really something going wrong here. Um, so this was the outcome. It was a product called Destinations. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it, you know, it, it, the process was 13 weeks from initial discovery through uh, product conception and, and, and finalizing the product. Um, so 30% less time. Um, what was telling is this client's confidence in this prediction market and indeed in this whole process was profound enough that they skipped some of the standard quantitative testing that you, they normally would have done um, in terms of volumetric forecasting and that sort of thing. Um, and happily for them and, and for us, uh, when the product did launch, it exceeded its sales forecast. So um, the point of this is just to say that um, <coughs> Any work you do in prediction market, I, I think, has got to be founded and based in, in as holistic uh, an insight as, as you can get. Um, I do think that, that the prediction markets are particularly well suited to uh, online communities because of the kind of intimacy and relationships um, that can develop in this more intimate and private and very high touch, highly facilitated sort of context. <clears throat> you want me to wrap this up or do you want to do this? I'm on a roll, okay. Um, I, I will say, you know, in the early days we encountered some skepticism. So we actually had, to, we, we've done a number of parallel studies as have other researchers in, in this whole field. Um, in our experience, when we compare prediction markets to traditional concept tests, to Matt's diff, um, to studies with samples that are in many cases more representative of the target market than a community may be. Um, we found that the outcomes are, are almost identical and that if anything, when we've actually been able to uh, compare prediction market results to real world sales data, 
we've actually found it to be more accurate uh, than traditional survey-based methods. Um, again, the gamification element, which badges is a piece of, but I think also, if you think about what are the attributes of games that make them engaging, there's this notion of risk and reward. Um, and that is a driver in prediction markets. There's, there's this mix of luck and skill, and again, that comes into play uh, to some small extent in prediction markets. So all of those gamification attributes tend to make participants more attentive, more literally invested um, in the outcome. So they're not straight lining their way through a, a bunch of ranking questions. They're, they're really paying attention. Um, Certainly, it helps that, that the Hunu platform is responsibly designed so people can do it on their, their mobile devices, their phones. Um, we're often asked about sample size, and, and I'm not sure, John, how you would answer this question. So if I'm going external sample and I'm running out to about 10 concepts, we can run this all the way up to 20. And that's not a systemic limitation, that's more of a time limitation, because I don't want to break that 10 to 12 minute barrier and lose all the mobile folks. So I'm doing 10 concepts, I'll probably run 350 completes. If I'm running 20 concepts, I'll probably run out to 500 completes. That's merely because, also because not everyone is forced to answer every question that's in there and evaluate every concept. It's only those they have knowledge and perspective on. So there's a pattern that comes in the answering uh, of those questions and the way that they allocate their tokens. And that ensures that we've got enough of a robust sample behind each concept that's being presented to them. Yeah, I'm just going to digress a little because there is there's a, a powerful emotional driver as well, and that is, so for example, we have a client that's a, a, a big theme park and movie studio and they do lots of stuff targeted to parents of young children. Um, and we did a prediction market for them about features and attributes of, of um, a whole new suite of hospitality and theme park offerings. Um, I am not in their target market, right? I'm too old, my kids are grown, um, under normal circumstances, I would have been screened out of a survey uh, about what attributes uh, were important. But the fact is, I have grandchildren. I am surrounded by millennial parents who are precisely in the sweet spot for this client. And I hear them you know, talk almost incessantly about their vacation plans and, and experiences uh, with this theme park. In other words, I have knowledge that given the opportunity, I could bring to bear. Um, and I think people have that hunger to bring their knowledge to bear. And I think prediction markets enables that um, in, in ways that traditional surveys targeted to a you know, tightly defined representative sample do not. Okay, so that's me stepping off my soapbox. Um, I, again, the other thing I'd say about the value of prediction markets is because when people invest, they're asked to explain why they have done what they have done, why they've invested that way. You do get to the rationale, the emotional, as well as the, the intellectual uh, rationale behind people's investment decisions. Um, and certainly the speed, uh, the quality, uh, I think all combine to make it um, not just cost effective uh, faster, but ultimately better than many of the alternatives out there. So let me stop. And, uh, <laughs> Don't look at this stage. <laughs> um, we got time enough to talk a little bit longer. Someone have an opinion, question, comment? Here we have one. Did you return your mic? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, here's the calm. Hi, I was just interested in, if I don't want to client names of course, but just some of the industries that you've been using the prediction markets for. <clears throat> I have experience in pharmaceuticals, automotive, entertainment, hospitality, um, consumer goods, telecommunications, software, finance and insurance. Um, it, my background is consumer goods, and that's where I grew up. I was trained classically by Pape Quaker and Pepsi. Um, but have branched out into a number of different verticals in the five years that I've been working actively with prediction markets. I found them highly effective in both a B2B and a B2C context and have not found a vertical yet where it's not effective. I'm not saying it's a panacea for everything, you know, but it's been very successful across all of those industries. 
I can't think of uh, an industry that John hasn't already mentioned. Well, uh, veterinarians has that. We, we've done, so, um, as John said, we've done this with pretty much every vertical out there and all kinds of people. So, you know, very heterogeneous communities, very homogeneous communities, B2B as well as B2C. I would actually say, I think in B2B, you know, where people are time starved, this is a particularly, uh, when you're working with physicians, with financial advisors, um, with professionals, you know, who think highly of themselves and their available time, this is a particularly powerful model that, that engages them actually a lot more than, again, a traditional survey would. Are you using the same sample over and over again to continue to do the work, or is there a new group that's brought in over time just wondering about, you know, do people get used to the process or? Yeah, great question. Um, typically, when we're doing it in communities, you know, we're doing it with, I mean, we're doing separate markets for each client and, and their own communities. Um, those clients that have embraced it, you know, their community members will participate in multiple markets, and so they become more uh, familiar with and intrigued by the methodology over time. And then we also do some work with direct with end clients when they're not, you know, say a client of Community Spatial, one of our other partners. And when we do that, I'll go and acquire sample to the research now and the GMIs, I mean, the usual cast of characters out there that provide sample. Um, and we're pretty much sample agnostic. And so that's a rolling sample. You know, it's almost impossible for people to be retained multiple times and get used to the methodology. Here we have another. Hold on for the mic, we need to record that. Your opinion is important for us. So for your prediction markets, do you typically go to like the, um, the qualified respondents or like if you're talking to um, people or women buying um, deodorant, do you, do you only want to talk to that specific audience or how broad do you actually want to go in terms of, of sampling people? Okay. In its purest sense, a prediction market is gen pop. You know, people test it and screen for perspective in its purest sense. Now, there's a, there's a difference between its purest sense and the real world. All right? there is, there's organizational biases and tolerances that come into play with a client base um, that may require more targeted sample. Um, I, that go to their traditional targeted sample. And the major implication is that you're going to lose some perspective, some different perspective, and there's a, there's a financial implication because the targeted sample is going to be more expensive than a gen pop. But what they do is they've bought into the core methodology, and the core methodology being, you know, how do you, you know, how are women 18 to 34 who are looking to maintain a healthy lifestyle going to respond to this piece of creative? Okay. So they maintain that outward looking, you know, perspective, going to the we and getting away from the me perspective. So it can be done with targeted sample, and to a certain extent, probably some of your communities may be. Yeah, so I, I mean, in, our, in some cases, our communities are, have been recruited explicitly to a targeted subgroup of people and are highly representative. In other cases, they're not. In other cases, it may be new markets or competitors, clients. Um, you know, in our experience, I mean, I think obviously in some very specialized, I mean, if we're doing something with a pharma company around a new treatment, obviously you need doctors who are specialists. But, um, but by and large, I think uh, the market benefits from a diversity of perspectives. And so to go back to my example, again, I would not have fallen into that target market, and yet I, I believe I had knowledge and energy uh, to bring to bear on the question. I mean, so along those lines, just to, to kind of close that one out, what I find is in a B2B session um, scenario, especially with IT professionals, a number of my B2B clients in that space really like the prediction market approach because what they find is when they go out to directors and above within the IT space and they ask them what's the next greatest thing that's going to come out there, they think, tend to think more about their organization and what the constraints are, and they're not getting clear direction as to what to do. But with the prediction market methodology that forces you out of that comfort zone and makes you think a little deeper, you know, so if you could do anything you wanted, what would it be and what's going to be, you know, how's it going to be predicted? They're finding much better results with the, the approach and the methodology than they are with tradition. And people are able to take that leap. So we just did a thing on sense for detergent and, and you know, the verbatim sort of show people like one, one person said, you know, I don't like citrus. But I know that most people do. I know that most people associate that with cleanliness and freshness. That's, 
that is a thoughtful, nuanced, and, and I suspect accurate response. So to John's point, part of the art of this is just in framing the question, not what are you like, what are you going to do, which is notoriously unreliable, but rather what do you think is going to happen? What do you think others are going to embrace? Okay. All right, now put one offer out to the entire crowd. And my CEO will probably shoot me for this one. All right. We run an omnibus. Um, and it's not testing new product concepts. It's taking a look at forward trends. You know, what's going to happen in the entertainment industry in 12 to 18 months? Will this software app work in the next 18 to 24 months? We have a booth over here in, I don't know, where is it? D. It's right by the espresso machine anyway. If you want to take advantage of this, we are running an omnibus next week. I will put a question in there for you on the omnibus because you were kind enough to be able to attend our session today at no charge. So stop by the booth. If you've got a question you want to put out there, we're wide open. Take the chance. Okay. Big.